Excellent. Yay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now that we have you on the line, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you so you can introduce yourself and give us a little bit of an introduction. Yes, yeah, so uh, hi, good morning everybody. And uh, firstly, I'm uh, delighted to be with you all this morning. And a uh, huge congratulations to all the winning teams from the 2017-2018 uh, Astro Pine competition. Uh, it's always, this, this competition holds a special place in my heart because it was one of the first ones that we decided to, to run with Mission Principia. Um, and when we started off, we didn't really have, I know, you know, what sort of response we were going to get. And the response over the years has just been phenomenal, just not just with uh, Mission Principia, but following on from that with Thomas Heskey's mission, with uh, Alan Espelie's mission, and of course, now we're going to be doing Pi again with Alex Guest's mission, who's just gone up into space. So thank you so much for taking part. Um, yeah, it's hugely important, um, Code Club, Code Dojo's, Raspberry Pi Foundation, these kind of activities are really giving you guys fantastic skills in computer science, computer coding. And what's, it, what's so impressive is just the, the kind of innovation and the blue sky thinking that you have come up with with these, uh, with these uh, ideas of how to use an astrofine space, be it using the infrared Earth observation imaging cameras, using the pixelation of the sensor for a radiation detector, calculating the speed of sky effects, looking at vegetation over planet Earth. I mean, the, the breadth and scope of what you've done is absolutely amazing. So thank you so much for taking part. Congratulations on being part of the winning team. And uh, I know we've only got about half an hour to talk, so I think I'll just hand it over to you guys to uh, ask any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. So we're going to run this much like an in-flight call where we're going to go around to each of the schools who are asked their questions one by one to you, okay? So we are going to start with uh, Team Aurora. So we will unmute you now. And Team Aurora, please go ahead and ask your question. Hello, greetings from Finland. We are Team Aurora and we'd like to ask you, Team Peak, how did you prepare for your trip to the space station? Well, hello, Team Aurora. Um, yeah, how do you prepare for a trip to the space station? Uh, it's not an easy task and it takes a number of years. Uh, I mean, really, you, you could say that astronauts have been preparing all their life for a trip to the space station. Uh, all of the skills that we acquire throughout our uh, careers um, are very important to use. But it actually takes about two and a half years specifically to train for a mission to space. Some of the things that we have to learn about are obviously that the whole space station, all the systems that it involves, the electrical systems, cooling systems, life support systems, that we need to be able to do spacewalk. So we spend a lot of time learning how to do spacewalk. We need to fly the Soyuz spacecraft to and from the space station. So that takes a lot of time. And that involves learning Russian. So they throw in Russian as well. Um, and in addition to that, of course, we need to know all about emergencies, what happens if something goes wrong. Yeah. And something else that's very important for astronauts to do is to use the robotic arm. Because a lot of our supply vehicles that come up to the space station, they don't dock automatically. They simply park themselves in a kind of holding orbit underneath the space station and it's up to the astronauts to use the, the robotic arm and go and capture that visiting cargo vehicle. So there's a whole range of different skills that we need to learn and things that we need to prepare before a mission to the space station, which is why it takes about two, two and a half years before you can launch. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. We're now going to move on to Team Earth Watchers. Uh, so we've unmuted you. Uh, and please go ahead and ask your question to Tim. Uh, hello, we are the Ed Walkers from Summer Robotics Academy Greece. And uh, our question is, uh, what do astronauts do for fun on the ISS? And be not careful not to bump any educational games or sports. <laughs> Um, yeah, so what do we do with fun on the ISS? We're just being on the ISS is a huge amount of fun anyway. Um, but specifically, we get a little bit of time to relax at the weekend. There's not really much time Monday to Friday, extremely busy. We work uh, from about 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and then we spend most evenings preparing for the next day. But on Saturdays, we get to do education programs. So in fact, a lot of the astro pie things uh, that I was doing on my mission, I would be doing them on a Saturday afternoon, uh, which is which is great fun anyway. Um, 
But actually, unbeknown, even unbeknown to mission control in Houston, uh, there is a toy box on the International Space Station from various <laughs> different things that astronauts have been taking up over the past 18 years that we've had astronaut science at the space station. Uh, and in there are some fun and games that we, we have. So, for example, the uh, hydrophobic uh, bats where you can play water ping pong. With. They're, in the, they're in the toy box. Uh, there's even a couple of Nerf guns in the toy box, believe it or not. Um, and firing a Nerf bullet down the length of the space station is quite a, a fun thing to do to see how far it will actually go in microgravity. Um, other fun things we do, of course, well, I think probably the, uh, the thing that most astronauts spend their free time doing is simply looking outside the cupola window and taking the photographs of planet Earth. It is absolutely stunning, the most beautiful thing you could possibly imagine. And so we don't get a huge amount of time to, to do that. And so we spend a lot of our free time just taking photographs or calling friends and family. But uh, we can also relax. We can watch movies up there. We have a, a projector and a white large screen um, that we use mainly for training and for work up there. But uh, we can also put a, a movie on there. So uh, two or three times in a mission, we might all get together as a crew and decide to watch a, a movie. Uh, in my case, in particular, when I got on board, um, the new Star Wars movie had just come out. So Scott Kelly had got that sense up when we sat down and watched Star Wars. So there is, there is time for a little bit of uh, fun on board the International Space Station as well as all the work that goes on. But great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to have to be sure not to tell Mission Control about the toy box. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll move on now to Team Spaceballs. So we have unmuted you, and please go ahead to ask him your question. Uh, so, hello, uh, we are Team Spaceballs. Uh, and our question is, uh, what is one of the best memories to go to the ISS? Great memories. Uh, it's hard to choose one, but I think um, for me, probably the best memory was being outside the space station on a spacewalk. And uh, one moment in particular was when Tim Cooper and myself, we had to get to the furthest edge of the space station. We were repairing one of the solar panels, uh, and it happened to be on the very, very edge of the space station. And we weren't able to repair sort of the electrical components until the sun went down because it was effectively the circuit breaker. And of course, all the live electricity is going into the solar panel through this circuit breaker. So Mission Control just said, hey, you know, hang out for 10 minutes and wait for the sun to go down. So Tim Coper and myself literally had, you know, 10 minutes out on a spacewalk just to enjoy the view of Earth and to enjoy being out there at the furthest edge of the space station with absolutely nothing over my right shoulder except the vast expanse of space in the universe. And it was an incredibly surreal 10 minutes, wonderful memory, and uh, just being able to watch Earth slowly slip into the to shadow as we went around the night side of planet Earth was, was spectacular. So that would be my probably my favorite memory that I have brought back with me. Thanks so much. Great question. Uh, okay, now we'll move on to Team Ursa Major. We have unmuted you, and please go ahead to ask your question. Uh, hi, I'm Dries from uh, Ursa Major, and my question uh, question is, uh, how is eating fruit in space different than on Earth? Uh, yeah, hi, Team Ursa Major. How is it different in space? It's a lot more fun, for one thing. Um, you know, eating eating food on, on Earth can be can be fairly boring with gravity, but when you've got microgravity, you can have an awful lot of fun with your food and your drink, in fact. The one thing you have to be careful is not to make too much mess. So we try not to have too much food that has got uh, too much liquid or sauce in. But we can eat soups even. You know, as long as you open the packet really carefully and you're very careful how you eat them, you, you can even have sort of thick soups. Um, but yeah, you can, you can play around with food uh, in terms of what you can make as well. Uh, we also have Velcro everywhere, so we can stick our packets of food to the table, to the walls. Our forks and our spoons have also got a Velcro everywhere. Um, but it, it, it's great fun uh, messing about. You, you wouldn't want things like crisps or biscuits up there. They would just make way too much mess. But we can actually have a few nice off-the-shelf things. So people send up chocolate bars, for example. Or what's also nice to take up is something that's uh, special to your nationality. Um, and then you all come together on a Friday night and have a really good crew meal and we all share food together. So that's quite a special thing to do as well. 
Thank you so much. Okay, now we'll move on to Team Astro Mega. Astro Mega, we have unmuted you. Go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so we are we are Team Astro Mega, and our question is: What were some of the main experiment themes that you studied on board the ISS? Okay, hi Team Astro Mega. Uh, yeah, great question. I mean, the whole the space station's up there primarily as a scientific laboratory. Uh, and in our six-month mission, we did over 250 experiments. So it, it's difficult to kind of nail it down to just one or, or two uh, examples. Generally speaking, the experiments that I enjoyed the most, and most of my astronaut colleagues enjoyed the most, are the life science experiments. Uh, primarily because, of course, we're guinea pigs, we're the subjects of those experiments. So we get very involved in them, we learn an awful lot about them before we fly. Um, and a lot of these experiments, the life science experiments, are, are all focused on the benefits for people on back on planet Earth. So they're incredibly valuable as well. Whether we're studying about our heart, our lungs, our eyes, our cardiovascular system, our immune system, our bone density to help uh, things like osteoporosis, muscle wastage, for example. So all of these life science experiments, very important. And, um, and I actually really enjoy learning the medical aspects behind them. Coming from a, a sort of technical background, military testifying background, um, for me, this was a, a new area. Uh, and I, I found it fascinating <laughs> learning about the medicine behind a lot of these life science experiments. So they were some of the, uh, the really fun experiments to do. But we're also doing some exciting stuff on the space station with new technologies, like um, researching new metal alloys. Um, uh, and also um, doing combustion experiments so that we can try and manufacture better propulsion engines for both back here on Earth and the space engines as well. So we, 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 you know, that kind of stuff is fascinating as well, working with real cutting edge technology. Uh, but I would say that probably the life science experiments were, were what I found most enjoyable. Great question, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. We'll now move on to Team Trantini Doc. Uh, we have unmuted you. Please go ahead and ask your question to them. Hello, uh, our team is Trentini Zot. We are from uh, Trento. Uh, we are now at the other school. Uh, with our, our partner in a So, question is, what is the typical astronaut day like? Do you need to perform physical activity each day? Hello, yeah, hi team, Trentini Doc, great to speak to you this morning. Um, yes, you do have to do physical exercise every day. Um, you can take one day off a week if you want to, but you know, most astronauts exercise every day for about two hours. Um, part of that is actually for pleasure. So most of us enjoy being fit and healthy anyway, and so we like to work out. But also, if you can imagine on a space station, uh, you float all day long, and you really don't use your muscles very much at all. It's very easy working on board the space station physically. Uh, the only time it's physically very, very hard is when you're on a space station. Um, but otherwise, inside the space station, for the most time, it's very easy. So we really actually enjoy, you really, feel like doing some exercise at the end of the day. So it'd be that jumping on the treadmill or on the bike machine, or we even have kind of a weight machine, although you can't actually lift weights in, in weightlessness, we use vacuum cylinders to provide resistance so we can exercise our muscles. Um, so yes, we work out every day, but you know, most of, most of our day are spent doing a mixture of science experiments uh, or maintaining the space station, um, as well as doing our fitness exercise and educational programs and, and other activities like that. Um, but probably uh, the, the science and the maintenance were two things that take up most of our time. Uh, the space station's been up there for 20 years now. It's been occupied for 18 years. So you can imagine that it does take a little bit of care and maintenance to keep it going. Um, and so sometimes that maintenance is outside the space station on a spacewalk, and sometimes it's maintenance inside the space station. But those two days are ever the same. And that's what is great about working up there is every day you're doing something different, either a different science experiment or working on a different part of the space station. Um, and so it, it's always an interesting time. And, and, and you also have to work with all the mission control centers around the world. So that's not just Houston, that's Moscow, that's Munich, uh, Scuba in Japan, uh, Huntsville for payloads as well. So we're work working with these control centers all around the world, which makes it a very, very interesting work environment. 
Well, you're certainly making us jealous, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. We'll now move on to Team Lampone. Uh, we have unmuted you, so go ahead and ask your question. Hi, I'm Nicola, Team Lampone from Connecticut, Rio Trento. The question is, how do you manage alternating day and night and night cycles on the ISS? And does the absence of regular sunlight affect to your body? Hey, Team Lamponi, uh, great question. It, it's quite hard in the mm -hmm. first few weeks when you arrive in space to get used to the fact that we're experiencing 16 sunsets and sunrises every day. Uh, of course, we go around the Earth every 90 minutes. And that does affect your um, your circadian rhythm, so your day-night cycle and your sleep regime as well. It's amazing, um, you, you don't notice down here on Earth, we, we're so used to, to living on Earth, but we don't notice how our bodies get into a very strict regime. And daylight plays an important part in that regime. It regulates when we feel tired, when we feel awake, when we want to eat, when we feel like exercising, even when we need to go to the loop. I mean, those kind of things are all regulated by Mother Nature. Um, and when you go into space, of course, that all gets a little bit mixed up. And for the first two weeks, it can be tricky to get to sleep. Um, and we tend not to sleep that long. Maybe that's because we're not so tired, because we're not working so hard in space. Um, but, you know, six hours of sleep a night for astronauts is plenty. You don't really need much more than that. I made one mistake uh, early on in the mission. I, I went it was about 11 o'clock at night. I was brushing my teeth, I was about to go to bed, but there was a fantastic task coming up over the Bahamas and I wanted to look and see the Bahamas. So I opened the hatch and of course it was it was midday in the Bahamas and all this bright sunlight came into the, the space station. I took some photographs, stayed there for about five minutes and I didn't sleep for the whole night because I had so much stimulation from all that ultraviolet coming into my eyes that my body was just like, okay, it's midday and you're not going to bed. So the worst thing you can do just before going to sleep is to look outside the window and say, we can close up the space station hatches at night so that it uh, helps us get used to going to sleep. And in fact, we did I landed um, we've changed our lights on board the space station, so they're not fixed frequency. They used to be just a fixed frequency white light, very much very clinical, like a laboratory. And now we can, we've got LED lights, so we can shift frequency. So we have blue-white lights during the daytime when we need to be alert, and then it starts to redshift during the night, and it gets much softer. So from the evening meal onwards, we're already trying to get our bodies into that good circadian rhythm. Uh, but yeah, great question. I mean, the, the day-night cycle is very important and, and light on the space station plays a huge part in our circadian rhythm. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. All right, now we'll move on to Team Enrico Ferni. We have unmuted you, so please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, this is Enrico Ferni from Italy, and I uh, want to ask you, how does the space change your way of thinking? Hey, Steve Enrico, it's good to speak to you this morning. Uh, how does it change your way of thinking? Wow, I think it changes you on a number of different levels. Firstly, it is very hard to go into space and not kind of have a change of perspective. When you, when you see planet Earth from space, I think the first thing that really strikes you is our atmosphere and the, the scale of the planet versus the rest of the universe, effectively. It's amazing how tiny planet Earth becomes when you're in space. Uh, it's also incredibly beautiful. You just see this wonderful uh, planet, uh, blue jewel, and, and um, the absolutely incredible sight. But the atmosphere is this just tiny, tiny, thin strip. Uh, and it becomes very evident that that is clearly the only thing that protects life here on planet Earth. So you get a completely new perspective of just how you know fragile we are. Um, it's very easy here on Earth to look up at the sky and just think, hey, the sky goes on forever. Uh, and, and then from space, of course, you realize just how valuable our atmosphere is protecting us from not becoming a planet like Venus or, or Mars. Um, and so that changes your perspective. Also, um, I think it changes your perspective in terms of uh, uh, cooperation. I mean, it's a wonderful international partnership we have on board the space station. We work with our 
Russian colleagues, our Japanese, Canadian, all Europeans together, and of course with our American colleagues as well. Um, and that's reflected in the view we see of Earth. I mean, in space you don't see any borders, you just see the, the continents of the world, you know, form that it had over the last four billion years, all the continents. Um, and it really does give you a new perspective of what we can achieve when we work together, when we cooperate, when we collaborate. And that is so important, not just in space exploration, but it's important uh, in everything that we do around the world. Um, so I think there's, there's those two elements where your perspective really does change from working in space. Thank you so much. Okay, now we will move on to Team Canarias Uno. We have unmuted you, so please go ahead and ask your question to Tim. How do I make a screen screen, my Josh? Hi, Tim. I'm Uno, and I'm Section A. Do you know what you were to say? Where would you like to go? Okay, and a little bit hard to be here, but I think it was where would I like to travel in space? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. Great. Um, yeah, good question. Where would I like to go? Um, well, I probably would say Mars, because Mars I find a fascinating planet and it's so interesting in terms of, uh, you know, a few billion years ago, three billion years ago, we think that Mars was quite similar to Earth in the fact that it had liquid oceans, um, and it could have supported life. We, we found very recently, in fact, the Curiosity rover on Mars has reported back that we found organic molecules in an ancient lake bed from Mars, so that we know it had uh, heat from the sun, we know it had water, we know it had organic molecules. Um, it's very possible that there uh, was microbial life on Mars, or maybe even still is. Um, some bacteria is incredibly resilient. We know that because we take it into space and we actually study bacteria in space outside the space station. A bacteria has survived for over a year in space. Um, and so it's, it's fascinating to think that Mars could have once harbored life um, and could in the future, uh, we hope, become another uh, possible uh, location where we can colonize and, and live and work on another planet. So for that reason, I find it absolutely fascinating. But there's also some really exciting uh, space in the uh, solar system that I hope that humans will get to travel to one day. Uh, the, the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, for example, um, uh, Europa, uh, Enceladus, where we've got uh, liquid oceans underneath icy crust, uh, and also moons like Titan, Saturn's moon Titan, uh, where it's just you know, phenomenally low temperatures and pressures that you've actually got liquid lakes, but not liquid water, they're liquid methane. Uh, I think it would be fascinating to go there and to explore. So I, I think our solar system provides an abundance of, of wonderfully exciting places to go and visit. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. All right, we will move on to our final question from Team Dark Side of Light. You've been unmuted, so please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, I'm Lisa, and this is Dal, and we're from the Dark Side of Light. And uh, our question is, did you face any challenges on the journey to becoming an astronaut, and how did you overcome them? Okay, Team Dark Side of Light, yeah, good to speak to you this morning, and a good question. Um, challenges, yes, and you face plenty of challenges um, in the whole journey in going to space. I mean, one of the greatest challenges, of course, is, is being selected as an astronaut. Uh, when I applied, there were uh, 8,413 candidates all going for what was then just four jobs. Um, and uh, I took that as uh, just a learning experience. The whole selection process, I just took it one step at a time. I decided that I would give everything, of course, 110%, um, very positive attitude, but I, I would try not to be too disappointed if I didn't get selected. I, I never went in there with a, you know, uh, thinking that I was actually going to make it all the way through. I just focused on one thing at a time, and it was only towards the latter stages of the selection process that I really started to believe that I actually had a, a genuine chance of, of being selected as an astronaut. Um, but I think really a lot of these, uh, a lot of the skills that a lot of you know, astronauts share are things like um, soft skills, so communication, teamwork, leadership, followership, um, self-confidence to a degree as well, uh, and these are skills that are learned throughout your whole life. 
And for me, I, I think that started off, you know, way back when I was a Cub Scout, then went into the cadet force at school, um, all of the sort of uh, extracurricular activities you, you do that give you all of these, these additional personality and character building skills. So that really helps. In terms of challenges with the training specifically, for me it was language. Um, I can't, you know, my background, as I said, is technical. So science and maths was not too much of a problem. And I absolutely love uh, learning about, you know, technical systems and spacewalking and, and, and the spacecraft, the toy spacecraft, for example. Learning a language for me uh, in my late 30s to have to speak Russian was very, very hard. Um, I had, you know, French GCSE was, was the, the, the maximum language ability I had before that. So I really had to go back to school and work extremely hard to uh, speak uh, Russian and learn how to speak Russian. Uh, but it just goes to show that if you're, you know, if you have the right positive attitude and if you work hard and if you're motivated, uh, you really can achieve anything that you set your mind to. And, and that's certainly something that I, I learned myself when I was learning Russian. Okay, thank you so much, Tim. So I'm aware we only have a few minutes left. Um, and to all of the teams, uh, Tim has had a chance to, to look over your experiments and, and see your project descriptions. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back over to you, Tim, just to, to give your uh, goodbye remarks to us and maybe if you have any comments for the team. Yeah, well, it's been, it's been wonderful speaking to you this morning. Thank you so much for your great questions. Um, I, I would just say to you, you know, keep up the, the fantastic work that you're doing. I think that, um, you know, studying computer sciences and coding is seriously one of the uh, greatest skills that you could be learning at this stage in your career, at this stage in your life, and it's going to set you up extremely well for the future. Um, we certainly need people with your kind of abilities and skills, um, and there are some really exciting careers to be had as well. So um, fantastic that you got involved in the Astro Pi Challenge. I'd encourage you to try and you know um, keep uh, keep the good work going and, and tell your friends about it as well and, and get more people involved. Um, but thank you very much. I'm certainly going to be following Alice's mission very closely and the new set of Astro Pi Challenges that are coming up. And uh, and I wish you all the very best of luck in the future. So thank you very much and keep up the great work. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. We're going to quickly go around to all of the teams so they can say a quick goodbye to you and give you a wave. So let's start with Team Aurora. You can go ahead and say goodbye. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, thank you, Team B. Thank you so much for having our question. It's been very lovely. Wonderful. Thank you, Team Aurora. Good to see you. Thank you, Team Aurora. Okay, and on to Team Earth Watchers. Uh, uh, thank you, it was a really enjoyable experience. Okay, um, thank you, Team Earth Watchers. Team Spaceballs. Thank you for that experience. Bye. Okay. Thank you. On to Team Ursa Major. Uh, uh, bye. Thank you for your time and uh, experience. Great. Thanks so much. On to Team Astro Mega. Thank you for uh, uh, this wonderful experience. Okay. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. On to Team Santini Dock. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Team mm -hmm. Lampone. Thank you, you for that. It was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Team Enrico Ferne. Thank you all the Afisa for uh, having given us this opportunity and uh, good luck to everyone. Bye. 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 Okay. Thank you. To Team Canarias Uno. Um, thank you for your meeting and your work. What are the things about Thank you, guys. Okay. And finally, Team Dark Side of Light. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with us today. It was really interesting and inspirational. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much. Okay, from all of us here at ESA, we just wanted to give a shout out to the Raspberry Pi Foundation who is uh, collaborating with us on this project. Uh, also to our colleague Dave, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but he was a big part of the program too. Uh, so from Elsa, Josh, and myself, thank you, Tim. Thank you to our wonderful team. Uh, and hopefully we will talk to you soon and look out for some of our, our new uh, news articles going up. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.